Welcome to Anatomy Physiology, Chapter 9, where we're going to talk about different kinds of joints. Here's one. Here's your ball and socket joint for your hip. There's your femur. And there's your vinegar cup, or acetabulum, as it's known. Most people think of joints as allowing movement. But we're going to find out that only a certain number of the joints permit movement and the rest of them prevent movement. So we're going to learn about those. The word for joints is articulation. So we're going to talk about different kinds of articulations. So you can take all of the joints that are in the body and you can look at them by what their function is which would be the freedom of movement that they have. Or you can look at how they are structurally made, what composes the intersection of where the bones meet. So the functional ones are diarthrosis, which are freely movable. So you can think about your shoulders and your hips. Amphiarthrosis is slightly movable. And synarthrosis, no movement. You don't want those joints moving. So you can do them by function, or you can talk about structurally how they're made. Are they held together by fibrous connective tissue, cartilaginous connective tissue? Is it bone that's fused to bone? And the word for that is synostosis. And I put it here because it looks a little bit like synarthrosis, synostosis. And both of these, the synarthrosis has no movement, and the synostosis has no movement. So that, when you see that, you go, okay, not moving. And then the synovial joints are the ones that are your diarthroses. Those are the ones that are freely movable. We're going to be learning about how joints are named. We're going to look at different kinds of fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints. And interestingly enough, we're going to find that joints change over time. So one kind of bone that articulates with another bone changes over time. And so we, we change the name of that particular joint. A classic example, if you've ever felt the top of a baby's head, they have a soft spot called a fontanelle where the bones haven't grown together yet and they always warn you don't touch it too hard because directly underneath it there's not bone there's actually the brain of the child and when you get to be uh, quite a bit older before puberty after puberty some around in that area now your bones are completely fused and you have sutures, you have fibrous tissue holding them together. And then if you get a lot older and you get to be in your 70s or your 80s, all of those uh, suture lines, all that fibrous tissue is replaced by bone. And so now you don't have an articulation. You have a synostosis, which is a bony joint where bone is joined to bone. If you see the word arthrology, then you know that this is the study of joints. And that's easy to remember because most of us have heard of arthritis. So that would be an inflammation of a joint. Arthritis. So arthrology, the science of joint structure and function and dysfunction. And then Kinesiology is a study of the muscles working with the skeleton and how you have movement. So this would be the study of diarthroses or synovial joints. Most of the joints are named after the bones that are articulating in the joint. For example, the radio ulnar joint is where the radius and the ulna join together or articulate. A lot of books don't include bony joints. They put bony joints in with the fibrous joints. 
but this book separates it out into four categories. So you have the bony, the fibrous, the cartilaginous, and the synovial. But bony joints are the fibrous joints that have just finished filling in, so the fibers are gone, and now you just have bone connected to bone. Uh, an example of that would be your sternum. Most of your sternum is fused. Here's an example of a variety of different kinds of joints that we'll be looking at. For example, here is your sacrum, which is fused right there, and it's joined with the iliac part of the pubic bone. And so you, it's called the sacroiliac. And the two halves of the pelvic girdle are held together by the pubic symphysis, the cartilage that's right there. And it is very barely movable. About the only time you would be able to move that particular joint is in childbirth. And with the baby pushing and pushing and pushing on this particular area as it tries to get through the birth canal, it can widen and soften this particular joint right there, the pubic symphysis. And in the beginning of this video, I showed you the head of the femur and how it fits into the acetabulum, which is the, that's acetic acid. Somebody who looked at that cup or the hole that this head fits into said that it looked like a vinegar cup. And so they named it the acetabulum because acetic acid is, is vinegar. So there's your acetabulum. So that joint is named not after the bone where it's articulating, but by the process. In this case, the socket, the hip socket. Usually the bony joints or the synostoses occur in bones that are held together by fibers, but occasionally you can have a cartilaginous joint that seals off and you just fill it in with calcium and um, phosphorus. So you, you ossify it or turn it to bone. Um, a classic example of that would be the epiphyseal plate where the bones, the long bones, get longer at the epiphyseal plate because you have cartilage there that is able to divide and make the bone longer. But once that fills in uh, with calcium and phosphorus, when it ossifies, then we, we call it the epiphyseal line. And at that point, you're not going to grow any taller. So for girls, it usually happens a little bit earlier. Guys can go and continue to grow all the way up to maybe age 21. But they usually seal off their epiphyseal plate along about 18. Just depends on the person. So other examples of where you're going to have the uh, bone join with the bone and become one continuous bone would be the cranial sutures that I talked about in older people. And the first rib and the sternum fuse together in old age. And the left and right mandibular bones in, a, in an infant, in a newborn. Here is an infant skull showing the fontanelle where the bones have not fused and you can see where these bones don't have clearly defined sutures yet and then there is your um, joint there which will fill in, will ossify. Moving on to the second type of joints we're going to talk about your fibrous joints also known as synarthroses in this one, the bones are held together by collagen fibers. Three kinds of fibrous joints. One of them are the sutures, which we mentioned on the skull. Gomphoses. This is a pocket in your jawbone where the bone or where the tooth sits down into the bone. And syndemoses. 
Here's a picture of the suture lines. So you have the coronal suture, the sagittal suture, the lambdoid suture, fibrous connective tissue holding them together. And there's the squamous suture right there that connects the temporal, parietal, and frontal bones. Gomphoses, again, are where you put your tooth down in the socket and you hold it in place with collagen fibers. So that's why it's one of the fibrous joints. The tooth can move slightly, not very much. You don't want it moving around. But we take advantage of this ability of the tooth to move slightly to put braces on people. And if you continue to put pressure and continue to put pressure, you'll actually remodel the jaw and you're able to move the teeth around a little bit. But it takes um, quite some time to do it. Ask anyone who's had to wear braces for very long. Here's a picture showing how the jaw is holding the tooth in place. And there's the fibers that are holding it. Now, one of the things I always caution my students, and I will caution you, is if you are not eating correctly, if you're not getting calcium in your diet, if you're not drinking milk, eating cheese, or taking a supplement of some kind, and especially you ladies, if you are pregnant and you're carrying a baby, and the baby is taking the calcium out of your bloodstream, one of the first things you'll notice is your jaw will dissolve and your teeth will fall out. A syndemosis is a fibrous joint where two bones are bound together by long collagen fibers. And you're going to find this in the ulna and the radius, and you find this in the tibia and the fibula. This causes these bones to act as one unit. So you're not going to be moving one bone or moving the other bone. Since they're tied together basically with this fibrous connective tissue, then they act as one bone. We usually think of fibrous joints as immovable, but in the case of the ulna and the radius, you do have a very little limited uh, ability to move the two bones through the syndemosis. The tibia and fibula are much less mobile. Moving on to the third type of joint, we have cartilaginous joints. And I, I always say, whenever you see the word cartilage, just in your mind say gristle, because that's pretty much what this is, it's gristle. So these are going to be amphiarthroses, and you can have the tiniest little bit of motion, a little more than you would with the fibrous uh, joints. And two types of cartilaginous joints are synchondroses and symphyses. So we saw the pubic symphysis, where you join the two pubic bones together. The epiphyseal plate that I was talking about is hyaline cartilage that is holding the ends of the long bone to the shaft of the long bone. So the end of a long bone is called the epiphysis, and the shaft of a long bone is called the diaphysis. So you've got the epiphysis, and then the epiphyseal plate, and then the diaphysis, the shaft, and then you come down to another epiphyseal plate, and you come down to another epiphysis, which is the other end of the long bone. So that would be an example of a synchondrosis or a cartilaginous joint. And then another example would be where the sternum and the costal cartilages are joined. The, excuse me, the first rib is attached to the sternum with costal cartilage. Here's a picture of it. Here's your first rib right underneath your clavicle. There's your clavicle. And there's your costal cartilage right there. 
The pubic symphysis is a cartilaginous joint and it is made of hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. Hopefully you guys remember from lab where you learned about hyaline cartilage and you learned about the chondrocytes and the lacuna and then you learned about fibrocartilage again you have chondrocytes in the lacuna and they're laying down collagen fibers so the pubic symphysis has both of these types of cartilaginous tissue and then if you go and look at the disc in between your vertebra they're also cartilaginous tissue so even though each of these does not move very much if you have a whole series of them it actually gives you a surprising amount of flexibility of your spine we learned about the shape of a rib and we learned about the tubercle that sticks off and here's where it's going to join with the transverse process of the vertebra and it makes an articulation there then you also articulate at the head of the rib and our fourth and last group of joints are the synovial joints so usually when you talk about a joint you are talking about a synovial joint since the others really don't move that much if at all so the other name for a synovial joint is a diarthrosis, which is freely movable. And there's usually a cavity in between them. So the bones are separated by connective tissue, by a disc, a meniscus, a ligament. So you have a little bit of, of uh, movement because of this separation. The problem is, if you separate the bones, then you have the possibility you can dislocate the bone, you can rip the ligament that's holding bone to bone. Going back to the picture that I started out this talk with, you can see here's the head right there, and now you can see the ligament that's actually holding this in the socket right there. But you also besides just having the ligament holding the bones in the sockets and stabilizing the joint you've also got other ligaments you've got muscles you've got fascia connective tissue so you have a number of things going for you to help stabilize your joints so usually people don't dislocate their hip joint what usually happens if something goes wrong is you get osteoporosis and it dissolves away enough of the bone that the head is still held up in the socket but the bone splits right there and then the person falls down so they say oh you know somebody fell down and broke their hip no they broke their hip right there and then they fell down because nothing was holding them up your synovial joints are usually the ones that are going to have some sort of a problem. If you're going to have a problem, that's where it's going to occur. So that's why I say if you are going to be a physical therapist, a physical therapy assistant, occupational therapist, athletic coach, nurse, uh, in that, that deals especially with the bones, uh, if you're going to be a fitness trainer, then you really need to spend a lot of time studying this more than we're doing just in an introductory anatomy physiology class. If you remember on the outside of your bones you have the periosteum, peri means around, the osteum, the bony heart, and when you get to the end of the bone the periosteum becomes much thicker and you have an articular cartilage right there. So there's your periosteum, and it's much thicker here. You do not want bone rubbing bone. It would be extremely painful. 
you in this case in this particular joint you also have a fibrous capsule but one of the most important things that you have in a synovial joint is synovial fluid so you're going to actually squirt synovial fluid into this joint so a lot of times you see people before they exercise and they stretch what they're doing is they're actually squeezing the synovial fluid out into this joint so that when they take off running or jogging or doing whatever marathon thing that they're going to do they have lubrication in the joint so that's why you call a synovial joint synovial because of the synovial membrane and the synovial fluid that fills there. And then when you sit down and you're not doing anything, then the fluid comes out of there and it waits until you need it again. So it's kind of neat. It's kind of a, like a little sponge effect in there. Uh, but as you get older, you your joints don't work as well and so you'll see an older person when they stand up a lot of times they're kind of stiff and they have a little trouble walking but after they walk for a little bit then they become more fluid and that literally is what's happened because the fluid is now in their joint allowing them to move more freely so the synovial fluid does more than just lubricate the joint it actually provides food for the articular cartilage and removes waste and if you were to feel it it would feel kind of like egg white and if you know about egg whites they have albumin in them and you have albumin in your synovial fluid also so that's why they feel kind of similar and you also have hyaluronic acid Those of you who have a car and you drive, you know that you've got to put oil in it to keep everything moving. And if you have the synovial fluid in the joints, it makes the movement of the synovial joints almost friction free. Going back and looking at this joint again, you have ligaments out here holding bone to bone. Here's another ligament holding bone to bone. And then inside there, you're going to have a fibrous capsule. So you're going to seal this area off in a capsule. And that's so that fluid doesn't leak out. You want to keep that fluid in that area. And then on the inside of that fibrous capsule is where you actually have the synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane is made up of cells that secrete synovial fluid but it also has macrophages in there so as you are walking running uh, you're going to get some wear down of your joint there and so any debris that gets into the cavity any of the cells that die you're going to eat that with the macrophages you're going to get rid of it get it out of the joint Some of your joints need a lot more protection than just the capsule with the synovial fluid. And in those cases, the fibrocartilage will actually grow inward from the capsule. And the one that you're most familiar with would be the meniscus in your knees. So you have it extending in from the left and, in, and from the right and they absorb shock and pressure. So when you think about jogging, and you hit your foot on the ground, that force goes up and hits your knee. So a lot of times runners mess up their knees pretty badly. But if you do it correctly, if you don't, uh, if you, well, that's where fitness uh, coaches come in. Can, they can tell you how to jog correctly and how to warm up correctly so you don't hurt your joints. But these cartilages, this, this meniscus, is supposed to absorb the shock so you don't tear your knees out. I thought this was kind of funny. So here is a, uh, I don't know if you know the story of the gingerbread man, but his, he runs around going, run, run, as fast as you can, you can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread man. 
So here he's going to the doctor because now he's hurt his knees. And the doctor says, well, have you tried icing it? So one of the things you do when your joints are swollen is you put ice on it, not icing. I often say that we are wondrously made. It is astounding to me that you can put two bones together, or three bones, and stabilize them and allow them to be pulled and use them as anchors to make your muscles work. I mean, that's just astounding that we have the ability to do that. So when we were looking at the picture earlier, I said that you can use ligaments to help stabilize the bones. You can use uh, tendons. And then you also, if you have a muscle and a tendon is passing over the bone, you can get some friction going there. So sometimes you put a bursa, which is a fibrous sac filled with synovial fluid, and you put it between the muscles where the tendon is going to pass over the bone. Or you can put it between the bone and the skin. So this is going to cushion the muscle, and it helps the tendon slide more easily over a joint. This is a picture showing your humerus, your upper arm bone, where it articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. So it hooks into there. And you have, here's an example of a bursa right there. And if you get an inflammation in your bursa because you overwork the joint, then we call it bursitis. So whenever you see itis, it is it means inflammation. Like appendicitis is an inflammation of your appendix, and tonsillitis is an inflammation of your tonsils. So bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa. A specialized bursa where you have it elongated and wrapping around a tendon, we call a tendon sheath. If you look at the hand, you can see some of the tendon sheaths and other bursa that are in the hands and the wrist. In this picture, they've made them green. So there's the uh, um, ulnar bursa right there, and then they've cut it so you can kind of see inside of it. And there's the retinaculum. Remember the band that holds the tendons down? And they've cut it away so you can look down inside and see where the bursa is. So your, your hand and wrist try to protect you from repetitive motion, but sometimes we get carpal tunnel anyway. And then there's some sheaths, some bursa sheaths. Here's a tendon sheath that they've cut open so you can see inside. Hopefully you guys had some sort of physics in high school and you talked about levers and the function of a lever. So if you look at the bones and you look how they articulate, they act like different kinds of levers. Here's one kind of a lever where you have the fulcrum in the middle and so your lever goes up and down. If one goes up, the other goes down. So that's one typical type of lever. Other levers, you have the fulcrum much closer to the other end. So your effort is going to be at one end, and your force to lift is at the other. So they show you how your arm or your elbow acts as a lever. Here's an example of a bone that has the fulcrum in the middle. And I like this on the slide where it says, loss of muscle tone occurs when you nod off in, lab, in a class or lab. <laughs> and uh, in faculty meetings, they always get you in there. At the end of a long, exhausting day, they turn out all the lights. They turn on a PowerPoint about something you really don't want to know anything about. And you're just sitting there, and it's 
quiet and the kids are gone and you just find yourself falling out of your chair and into the floor. So I'm glad I don't go to faculty meetings anymore. All right, a lever with a fulcrum at the end. An example would be pulling your leg up, bouncing a baby on your knee, or a wheelbarrow. So here's your effort, and there's the fulcrum right there at the wheel. In this one, the fulcrum's here, but the resistance is kind of centered between the effort where you're lifting up, or in the case of the leg where you're lifting up to bounce the baby. But another type of a lever that has the fulcrum at the end, your effort is in the middle and the resistance is at the other end. So here's an example in the body of the wrist. And here you go, the paddle. So you're, you're holding it there. The fulcrum is up there and your resistance is the water itself. You're pulling through the water. So I'm not going to test you over levers, but it's interesting to, to realize where the effort is, where the resistance is, and how you move past that using your joints. You need to know these words for range of motion. So you can flex. So in this case, you're pulling your arm upward and it causes this muscle to bulge. So in the next chapter, we're going to find out that that's your biceps right there. And then you extend. So in this case, you relax this muscle and you tighten this muscle under here and the muscle here. So it extends your arm. So we're going to learn about that in the next chapter. And then if you pull your, uh, in this case, it's the leg out. We call it abduction, and it's easy for me to remember because to abduct somebody is to steal them away. You take them out of their house or their car, and you take them away. So if you take a limb and move it further away from the body, you are abducting it. And then if you pull it back in so it's closer to the body, then it is adduction. So you're adding it back. So abduction and adduction, I don't think you'll have any trouble with that. Rotation, I don't think you'll have any trouble with that either. Some joints you can rotate, some you can't. Obviously, I can rotate my head. I can shake no. I can shake my head no. I can twist my foot from side to side. So I can rotate my leg to do that. I can also rotate my arm so I can flip my hand forward or backwards. And you can actually rotate the um, where the shoulder joins, where the humerus goes into the glenoid fossa. At this point, you can not only rotate it, you can do something we call circumduction. So you can make an entire circle. You can take your arm and move it around in an entire circle. So that's circumduction. One of the top things that people who are in the physical therapy field do is try to give back the range of motion to people because as you get older you tend to have trouble doing things that you used to be able to do. A classic example is when you're younger you can just reach behind you and uh, attach your bra strap behind your back and when you get older you actually have to have somebody who can reach back there and help you with your bra on or off or to zip you up because you can't reach back there, you've lost your range of motion to be able to reach in behind you. Now, I do want to point out something that I think is kind of important. There is something called Ehlers-Danlos condition, and I've got it right here. I wrote it there. When you have loose ligaments, you're considered to be double-jointed. And some people have hyperextensible joints. 
So they go beyond just being double jointed. And the problem is they have loose ligaments in all a lot of the places in their body. So it's not uncommon for them to slip a disc in their back or for the the joints that hold your foot together to give way and the bones that make up the arch of your foot your metatarsals start moving around and some will stick up and some will stick down and it's very strange um, the people who have Ehlers-Danlos can a lot of times reach over and take their shoulder out of its socket and pull it around to the front of their body. They can take their kneecap and push it around back behind their knee. So instead of being in the front of their knee, they could just push it around towards the back. And it's not just the cartilage in the joints that's gotten loose, but the skin is also loose. So it's hyper stretchy. And one of the quick tests to see if you have Ehlers-Danlos is if you can pull your thumb down onto your arm. So you can pause the video for a minute and see how far towards your arm you can get your thumb. Most of you can only get it about halfway there and then your range of motion of your wrist stops. But if you have loose ligaments and you could just go on and pull it all the way down like that. The reason that I point this out is because a lot of people who have it, they just think they're double-jointed, and they don't really think anything about it. And they end up having all sorts of unnecessary surgeries because if you have these loose ligaments, then your disc will just slip back in place. You don't need surgery to go and push the disc back in place. Of course, they're going to slide out again, so you have to learn how to keep from hyperextending your joints. But before I would have surgery for a slip disc or something like that, I would check and make sure that I didn't have Ehlers-Danlos first. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the six kinds of synovial joints, but it's interesting to look at them. You have the ball in the socket, which we've talked about, which allows circumduction and all sorts of free-ranging motion. And then you have some that are just hinged, like your elbow. That, that's it. It's just hinged. So you're not going to be doing a whole lot of swiveling of that one. And a plain joint is where they slide side by side. So they're both flat and they slide across each other. And then in your fingers, you have the rounded edge and it fits kind of like in a little pocket there. So that's the condylar uh, joint, saddle joint, and a pivot. So spinning around, pivoting. The only examples of the ball and socket, of course, would be your shoulder and your hip. The atlas and the axis, which is the first and second cervical vertebra where your head rests, is a pivot. So you, you know that because you can turn your head from side to side. And we talked a little bit about that when we did the bones, especially in lab because the atlas and the axis do not have a, an intervertebral disc. There's no disc there. So when you turn your head, if you're in a quiet place, you can actually hear the bone grinding against the bone or crepitating. That's what it's called when you rub bone against bone. It crepitates. It makes a creaking noise. And you can actually hear it. And as you get older, it's louder because you crepitate more. You become decrepit. And this is just a picture I threw in because it is amazing how we are able to stabilize the hip. So you have 
the ligament inside here that's holding it in place. You have these on the outside. You have the capsule that's holding it in place. And then you have all of these outside extending from the ilium down to the femur, from the pubis over to the femur. Hopefully when you did chapter one, you looked at what the standard anatomical position was. And if you're going to be talking about someone's joints, you need to know what the standard anatomical position is, and then you can tell how far that person can move out of the standard anatomical position. So uh, the joint movements described as deviating from zero position or returning to zero position. Here's someone standing in the correct anatomical position. So your hand should be uh, facing, or palm should be facing forward. And I thought this was funny. Here's a man who takes his car in to have it serviced, and the mechanic says, there's nothing wrong with the car. That creaking and popping sound you're hearing is just your knees. So one of the things that my students usually ask me at this point in time when we're having face-to-face -face lectures is what what is that popping noise when you pop your joints? And it is it is a pushing out of gases, trapped gases. So while most mothers would tell their child, no, 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 don't do that. Don't crack your knuckles because it'll cause you to have arthritis. That's not true. You're just pushing gas that's trapped in a joint and you hear it pop when it comes out. So popping your knuckles doesn't cause arthritis, but it does drive your mother crazy. So here's an example of extension where you go out to the zero point, and then flexion where you come back up. And then this is an example of flexion, extension, and there's hyperextension. And again, someone with Ehlers-Danlos could flip their hand considerably further back than this. But that would be to hyperextend your joint. You can go through and look what flexion and hyperextension look like for each of your joints. And here's some fun information. So if you happen to be at a party and you want to really wow them with your knowledge, you can talk about hyperabduction is where you raise your arm over the back or the front of your head. So instead of just doing jumping jacks, you can actually pull your arm further over. And adduction this would be hyperadduction if you cross your fingers or you cross your ankles. I think elevation and depression are kind of self-explanatory. You can elevate your shoulders or you can depress them, push them down. When I look at this, the protraction and the retraction I'm reminded of the song, Walk Like an Egyptian, where you pull your head forward and you pull it back to walk like an Egyptian. And here's a lady doing circumduction. She's moving around in a circle. You can have medial internal rotation where you pull a limb in towards the middle of your body. Or you have lateral external rotation where you move it away from your body. Supination is turning the hand forward anteriorly so the palm is facing forward or lifting it up. So I think about supination uh, when I think of someone who's begging. They put their hand out with their palm outstretched to hopefully signal to you that they would like some money or food or whatever it is that you have that they want. 
and pronation is where you flip it where your hand is backwards or you pull your hand back um, in the posterior direction. So pronation, posterior, supination reminds me of supplication or begging for something. Here's an example of protraction of your mandible. And so that look is called pugnacious. So protraction causes a pugnacious face. And retraction is where you pull your jaw way back. And we also have the ability to do what they call lateral excursion. So you can literally take your jawbone and push it over to the outer part away from the midline of the body and you can pull it back to the other side so you can do lateral, lateral excursions in both directions so that would be wagging your jaw in a couple of chapters when we get into the nerves we're going to talk about the Babinski reflex and normally if somebody tickles you on the arch of your foot you curl your toes downward but if there's something wrong with you, if you've had um, uh, nerve damage, then you'll actually flare your toes. So that's, that's a bad sign. But in little babies, they flare normally. So if you're doing a Babinski test, you need to know whether you're doing a kid or if you're doing an adult. Because we'll curl down and they'll flare out. If we flare out, there's something wrong with us. So here they're talking about the supination of the foot and the pronation of the foot. And they said it's a combination of plantar flexion. So that would be where you're curling your toes under. Inversion and adduction. Pronation of the foot is dorsiflexion, eversion, and abduction. So you don't have to learn these. But feel free to do so if you're going to go into any of the uh, physical therapy type fields. I'm not going to ask you to know all the processes and the information about the temporomandibular jaw joint or the TMJ as it's called. But one thing I do want to tell you, if you grind your teeth at night, then you're going to have... Uh, TMJ problems and what they usually do to stop it is to give you um, what they call an appliance, a dental appliance, also known as a bite guard. So here's one that's a little bit fancier than others, depending on how much money you want to spend. But this is going to keep you from grinding your teeth together and it'll save your temporal mandibular joint and just for fun if you have a really deep yawn or you lower your jaw too much you can actually dislocate the TMJ so the condyles pop out of the fossa and they slip forward so all you have to do is push down on your molar teeth while pushing the jaw backward and you can push it back into alignment I remember having a dentist pop my jaw out of its socket when he was trying to get in to one of my back teeth. And I was just a little kid and it freaked me out. So there's roughly 330 million people in the United States and about 75 million of them have TMJ syndrome. And you know that you've got it if when you open your mouth, your jaw clicks. If you have pain radiating down from your jaw, down into your neck and your shoulders and your back, or if you have facial pain, severe headaches, vertigo, which is dizziness, or tinnitus, which is ringing in your ears. So mild, moderate, severe but it's usually misalignment of your teeth, malocclusion, we call it.
In the next chapter, we're going to talk about the muscles that form the rotator cuff and the tendons. They spell S-I-T-S, -S, sits. So there's a foreshadowing of what we're about to learn. You've probably heard of people dislocating their shoulder. You literally pull the head of the humerus out of the pocket that it's sitting in, the glenoid process. This is because the rotator cuff protects the joint in all directions except for underneath. Inferiorly, you don't have protections. So if you pull your arm out, abduct means pull your arm out, and then there's a blow from above or there's a strain from above, it can pull the, the head of the humerus out of the glenoid process. Children are especially prone to dislocation. I want to, I want to emphasize that. You look at a picture like this and you think, oh my goodness, that is the cutest thing. Look at that little kid and look at mommy holding one arm and daddy holding the other arm and how sweet that is. And you remember what I said will cause dislocation of the shoulder. You abduct, you pull the arm out, and then you put a force pressing down here that will just pull that right out of the socket right there so this while looks very sweet and loving is actually not really great for the kids shoulders the hip bone is also known as the coxal joint and that's where the head of the femur sticks into that vinegar cup the acetabulum of the hip bone This one just struck me as kind of funny. So here's a personal injury attorney that's going to be getting a malpractice settlement for this guy because when they did his hip replacement, they put his leg on backwards. In most labs and in most introductory anatomy classes, they will use the knee joint as the model or the representative for all the other joints. So they figure if you understand how the knee joint works, because it's one of the most complicated of your synovial joints, then you'll understand how the other joints work. So in your lab, you're uh, required to know about the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL. I call it the million dollar ligament because when it gets torn, whoever just signed that multi-million dollar football contract, you're down and out. ACL goes. And here's your uh, meniscus right there. So you have not only the covering on the ends of the bone, but then you have these really thick pads of fibrocartilage to give you extra um, protection in there and then you have your posterior cruciate ligament the tibial collateral ligament the medial condyle is the end of the bone there and you have your articular cartilage for the tibia is right there underneath the lateral meniscus Here's the anterior cruciate ligament. If you're looking from the anterior view, that's why they call it the anterior cruciate ligament, because you can see it in the anterior view. But you can also see it in the posterior view if you're looking from uh, behind the knee. And then you have the collateral ligaments. And this one is the one that's going to connect the tibia to the femur. So it is the tibial collateral ligament. And then this one is the one that attaches the femur to the fibula. So this one would be your fibular collateral ligament. 
So you've got ligaments inside holding the bones together, and then you have stabilizing ones on the outside that try to hold it in place. I thought this was funny too. The difference between retirement and old age is where you put the ice. So in the case of retirement, you put it in your glass of liquid, whatever you're drinking, and in the case of overexertion, then you have to ice the joint. Just a fun fact to know, one of the things that helps us stand up is our ability to lock the ACL. So when your knee is fully extended, you can lock it. This is an interesting autopsy picture where they've taken someone's knee and you can see the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament in there. But what they've done is they've cut the patellar ligament. So here's the patella kind of embedded in this ligament. And then this has been flipped down. So if you could imagine flipping this back up so the patella is here and then extending this on up and attaching it up higher. So they've cut that away and then lowered it down here so that you can see the inner workings of your knee. One of the more interesting things about your joints, people who have damaged their joints just by getting old or by doing sports or by doing over-exercising, they're going to start developing arthritis in their joints. They're going to be replacing some of the connective tissue, some of the gristle, with bone. And one of the things that old people say that they can do is they can tell the weather by whether or not their joints hurt. They'll be sitting there and they'll go, oh, my joints are starting to hurt. It must be about to rain. So there is barometric pressure that alters when it starts to rain, but whether or not it is able to act on the joints, old people swear by it. So here she's saying, my hip joints hurt, my knee joints hurt, and my lower back hurts. My triple action Doppler says it's going to rain. When you look at people playing football and all of the weird motions that they do, unnatural motions that they do with their body, it's amazing that any of them have knees that work anymore. But the most common, I mentioned the ACL, but you can also tear your meniscus. And the problem with that is you don't have blood in the meniscus. You don't have blood in the ACL. So it's really hard to get them to heal. So a lot of times you're going to have to do surgery. So they'll shave the torn ends to make them smooth. And then they'll sew them together to allow them to see if they'll grow back together. The good news is we've gotten really good at doing arthroscopic surgery. So they just make a very small incision around your knee and then they put the light inside there so that they can see what they're doing and then they make another slit so that they can go in with their uh, tools that they're going to be taking away the torn tissue and reattaching. So there's less tissue damage. Uh, a lot of times you're awake when they're doing it. They just numb your knee and you get to watch them do it. And I think this is kind of funny because if you ask an athlete, they're going, what? Because if you do arthroscopic surgery rather than cut the leg open, cut the knee open, you recover more quickly. So it's only going to take you about nine months to heal. When you're watching a thriller and someone is chasing somebody through the forest, the person is always running full out, and they're looking over their shoulder instead of looking where they're going. And so they invariably fall down, and then they sprain their ankle. So a sprain is you didn't break the bone. You tore some of the ligaments or the tendons. So you get a lot of pain, and you get immediate swelling. One of the things that men get much more commonly than women 
is something called gout. And for some reason, you deposit uric acid in the joints, usually your big toe. And it is unbelievably painful. I've talked with some men who had gout and you can't even wear a sock. You can't have anybody touch your toe because it'll make you scream. So here's a cartoon I found about gout. And he, she says, take a look at the lineup, ma'am. Can you identify which one is gout? And she says, all of them. So it's usually your big toe. But you can get it in your fingertip, in your wrist, in your ankle, even in your elbow. So you have to modify your diet and cut as much uric acid out as you can or things that cause uric acid to build up in your body. And they also have medicines you can take that will prevent the buildup of uric acid. Here are some things that can go wrong with your joints. Arthritis, of course, is one of the most common things. A person who works with arthritis is called a rheumatologist. They, they also work with other joint disorders, but arthritis tends to be one of the main ones. So osteoarthritis or bone arthritis is the most common, and you get it usually old age or a lot of sports injuries. Your articular cartilage softens and starts to degenerate and you start putting bone in that area. So you get bone spurs and they pinch against the nerves and you can actually hear if you lose this cartilage because now the bones are going to start rubbing against each other. So that noise you hear when you shake your head slowly back and forth and listen to the atlas and axes crepitate across to each other, you now can hear the crepitus in other joints. Another kind of arthritis is known as rheumatoid arthritis. And in this, you actually think that your joints are foreign invaders, and you send your own antibodies out to attack your own joints. So you start to degrade the articular cartilage, as you do in other, and the joint turns to bone. If you leave a joint for any reason, or you don't move it, it'll actually start fusing. This is one of the things that if you're going in the medical profession and you're working with people who are bedridden or people who are in a coma, it's very important that you move their joints. You keep their joints moving because you can actually solidly fuse the joint to where the person will never move their arm again, never move their leg again. So it's really important to keep working your joints so you don't get ankylosis. A person who has rheumatoid arthritis, they usually treat it with steroids. The problem with that is that's gonna lower your immune system. So in this time of COVID, they keep talking about people who have conditions that cause them to be more likely to get COVID or more likely to have a severe case of COVID. If you are on some medication that suppresses your immune system, then you don't have the ability to fight it off. So you can take aspirin, which will help with the inflammation, Tylenol. And if it gets bad enough, they actually can just replace the joint. So at my age, I have a lot of my friends who have artificial hips, they have artificial knees. This is what untreated rheumatoid arthritis looks like. So there's the gnarled fingers there and the swelling there. And then if you look at it, you can see it's actually pushed almost dislocated. There are plenty of online videos that you can go and watch 
showing how they do a knee replacement, how they do uh, arthroscopic surgery. But it's kind of interesting to look and see how they do uh, joint replacement with the metal and the plastic. I want to spend a few seconds showing you some joints in action. Here's your ankle, your toes, your shoulder, your cervical vertebra. You can also find videos of hip replacement. And one of the things that's truly moving, uh, maybe to the point where you want to throw up, is when they hammer this metal piece down inside the bone since the head of the femur is broken off. <laughs> 